Well, a lot of questions can start uh, coming up at Christmas time. Uh, the children can start asking, is Santa for real? The adults can begin asking, is the virgin birth for real? And a lot of people this year might be asking, can't God just send us a vaccine already for Christmas? Well, questions can be a part of faith and uh, faith can get very messy. And so we're going to look at that today. So welcome to worship. And we thank those who are involved in worship today. We th uh, thank Jackie and Pam, but also those bringing Christmas greetings today. And so thank you for joining with us in worship and let's worship. Good morning. Last week, on the first Sunday of Advent, we lit the candle of hope. On this second Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of peace. Lord, today we recall your faithfulness. Thank you that you walk with us every day, that you are with us always. We proclaim that your promises are true and your goodness and love never fail. In this moment, we come to you and lay our lives before you. May we honor, worship, and adore you with every fiber of our being. Father, we proclaim that you are the Holy One, the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Your beauty and majesty are beyond compare. On this day, we join with those who worship and confess you as Lord, from generations past and present, and with all the angels that sing in the heaven of your greatness and splendor. Lord, we adore you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we bow down and worship you. Let us pray for peace through the scriptures. In Philippians 4, we read, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. Lord, peace is something we all long for, especially for our wider world, that all the conflicts would end, that peace would be gladly given and received by all peoples. We thank you that when unexpected issues suddenly confront us, such as COVID-19, that tend to shake up any sense of peace we may have had, that we can turn to your promises that you are always with us. You never leave or forsake us. We pray for all who are known to us in our families and our neighborhoods, who are sick physically or emotionally, who are hungry or are under addiction to hide from fear, May the God of peace heal and comfort them according to your will. In John 14, we read, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In 2 John chapter 1, we read, Grace mercy and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Let us pray together the wonderful prayer that Jesus left us where we are able to receive hope, peace, joy, and love. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Good morning. The scripture reading this morning is from Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 25. 
and I'm reading from the New International Version. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron, and both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done for me, she said, in these days. He has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are continuing on in our series called The Most Messed Up Christmas Ever. And just as Christmas can get quite messy, well, so too can faith actually get messy. Do we believe this? Do we believe that? Faith can get to be a messy thing. And it can sometimes feel like we have this pressure from, from society to not believe anything. And then, of course, there can be this feeling of a pressure within church circles to not doubt anything, to never have a question. And so faith can get messy, especially when questions do come up, uh, when, when we start doubting certain things, perhaps, that we were, have been long held uh, to be true. Faith can get messy. Well, we're going to talk about uh, somebody for whom his faith got messy, and it's going to help us out today as we think of Zechariah. His faith got kind of messy, and here's Zechariah. He's a priest, and uh, he's, as we meet him in the beginning of Luke, and the, really in the beginning of the Christmas story, and there he is in, serving in the temple and doing a once-in-a-lifetime thing. The lot falls to him, uh, of all the priests, the lot falls to him that day to offer the incense from within the temple. Not in the most holy place, but in the holy place in the temple. So this was a great privilege uh, that this was probably the only time he would ever get to do this. So there he is in the temple doing his thing. And what, what happens next? There is an angel appears to him. And he's, as always happens, basically when angels appear to anybody, he's terrified. And the angel's like, don't worry, don't fear. Uh, but rather, I've got a, a good news for you. And that is that despite the fact that 
you and your wife are quite old, elderly, you're going to have a baby. And this baby's as John the Baptist. What a privilege, what a wonderful good news this was. Well, how did Zechariah respond? Well, he responded with a question. Let's, let's see what that question was here again. In verse 18, Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. <laughs> How on earth is this going to happen, in other words? Uh, Zechariah is really questioning here and he's got some doubt. And the angel replied to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I've been sent to speak to you and to bring this good news. But now because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. So Zechariah is in a wee bit of trouble with the, uh, the angel here and basically he is silenced until John the Baptist is born. And so his disbelief, his questioning has a consequence for him. And this can cause us to wonder about faith and disbelief. And what's interesting about Zechariah is that he's mature and he's been basically a mature Jewish person for his entire life. And he's been a priest for as long as you're, you're allowed to be a priest. And so he's mature in his work. He's, he's, he's got a mature faith. He's a, a good devout man. They, both he and his wife are described earlier as being righteous. Uh, they are good, good people. And yet he's this good religious man standing in the temple doing this good religious thing. And yet he's not prepared for the supernatural. He's not prepared for the supernatural. And you know, maybe that could describe a lot of people in our society. And maybe actually it could describe a lot of people even within churches. That we can be doing the best we can to be good, righteous people. And yet, maybe we're not prepared to experience the supernatural. We're not prepared to experience the work and, and the hand of God in our lives in a profound way. And you know, Christianity is really a response to God's supernatural work. Christianity is a, is a response to God's supernatural work. Uh, we can think back to three miracles in particular that, that ensure that Christianity is a thing. And the first is this, God created everything. He conceived of the, of the universe and all its vastness and how big it is, but he also conceived of even the tiniest little specks of it. Uh, all of that was part of the conception of God and he brought it about, he created it. That is a huge miracle. And so then you, let's move to the next miracle that is super important for Christianity and without which we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be Christians. And that is the virgin conception. And a lot of skeptics will say, well, how could you ever believe in that? Can't you just see that that is a myth? Well, remember, if God conceived of the entire universe and all of its vastness and all of its tiny specks, if God conceived of all that and brought it out, brought it about, then yeah, God can conceive a little baby. Uh, that would not be a hard thing for him to do at all especially if he has a good reason to do so. And he has a good reason to do so, which brings us to our third miracle, the resurrection. And there is this wonderful miracle of Jesus, though he was, he, he was put to death, he rose from the dead. And that speaks to us about that good reason for the Christmas miracle and the Easter miracle. It's God's love, God's love for us. Uh, that's why he created the universe in the first place, his love to, to create us, to be in relationship with him, but also the miracle of the incarnation. That's what Christmas is really about, the miracle of incarnation, God being with us. He incarnated himself. He became uh, one of us in Christ. And so uh, Jesus Christ with us, Emmanuel, God with us, uh, that wonderful miracle, but so that he came to us so that he could die for us, so that... Uh, so that this, the consequence of our sin, he took that consequence. That separation from God that we experienced because of our sin, he experienced that on our behalf. And so the miracle of Christmas, the miracle of Easter, 
uh, these, these are things that of course we're not going to see. Uh, of, of course, as a, a scientist looking at, at how the world works, they're never going to see people rising from the dead generally, and also they're not going to see virgin, birth, virgin conceptions generally. Of course that's not going to happen. But when God wants to express his love, he's going to do it that way. You know, as an expression often used by uh, those who are skeptical and full of doubt about Christianity, they'll say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And so I've often heard that extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. Well, first off, that's not true. Extraordinary claims don't demand extraordinary evidence. They just ex demand good evidence. And there is good evidence for the truth of Christianity. And there are many books and many resources you can look into that. There is uh, good evidence for Christianity. Uh, uh, Josh uh, McDowell's evidence, uh, uh, evidence that demands a verdict being one book amongst many others. Uh, so extraordinary claims like virgin conception or extraordinary claim like the resurrection of Jesus just requires good evidence. That's the first thing. But the second thing is this. Let's rephrase that. Extraordinary love. In Jesus, we have extraordinary love of God provides extraordinary evidence. The extraordinary love of God has provided extraordinary evidence. The evidence of the love of God it's in the incarnation. It's in the birth of Jesus. The evidence of God's love for us, it's in the miracle of Easter, the death and wreck. That's, isn't that a miracle in itself that, that, that Jesus would want to die for the forgiveness of our sin? That uh, that's, seems like a miracle to us, but that's absolutely natural when that's God's character's love, that that's what he's going to want to do for us, the death and resurrection of, of he himself, God with us, uh, so extraordinary love provides extraordinary evidence through uh, Christmas and Easter. And so here is this beautiful evidence of God's love. Are we ready to respond to the supernatural? Are we ready to look back in history and see God working supernaturally at creation, at Christmas, at Easter, and say, wow, I'm going to take a step of faith to trust not only that God is, but that God is love and that God loves even me. Are we ready to take that step of faith? So that's the first thing that we can look at with Zechariah, with his messy faith of he's just not ready to experience the supernatural. Are we ready to experience the supernatural? Are we ready to look back and see God's love expressed in supernatural ways? And are we ready even now to be open to God's work in our lives in supernatural ways, ways that might even be surprising and ways that might not be surprising at all. So are we ready to take a step of faith or like Zechariah, are, uh, are, we, are we scared and, and, f and just full of doubt? But here's the second thing we can say about Zechariah and about messy faith. Now, I could preach to you a sermon, I, you know, I could have stopped the sermon right there and I could basically just scold you for not having enough faith. I could scold, we could look at the angel scolding Zechariah for not, for doubting there. Uh, and maybe I could build a sermon on that and I could scold you for not having enough faith. And, and you could go through life and every time you have a doubt, every time you have a question, you might scold yourself for not having enough faith. That's not looking at the story from broad enough uh, view. Let's take a step back from the story a minute beyond the angel saying, come on, Zechariah, let's move back and see, look at the bigger picture. And what do we see? We see that his doubt, we see that his question and his questioning, it did not disqualify him from being part of God's people. It did not disqualify him from being a priest. In fact, it, as you read on, you discover that he continues doing uh, the work of the priest for the, for, for the time he's supposed to, for the duration, even though he's, he's, he's silenced, but he still does his work. He's not disqualified from being a priest. He's also not disqualified from being the father of John the Baptist. He's not disqualified from that. You see, Zechariah's faith may have gotten quite messy, but it didn't mess up God's plan. Zechariah's faith got messy, but it didn't mess up God's love and what God was doing through John the Baptist, which of course John the Baptist is pointing to Jesus. And this is all part of the Christmas story, the birth of John the Baptist, the birth of Jesus. 
none of that is messed up. The Christmas story isn't messed up because of Zechariah's moment of doubt or his questioning. Um, and so when we have moments of doubt, when we have moments of questioning, let us be careful to, well, sometimes we maybe need to tell ourselves to, come on, let's take a step of faith here. And this is reasonable. We can, we can trust this. We can trust God. Maybe we need to say that to ourselves, but also maybe we need to give ourselves space for questioning, to give ourselves space for asking questions and for maybe even doubting. And I would want to say there's no need to ever doubt God's love for us. The, again, there's extraordinary evidence of God's love uh, because of the because of Christmas, because of Easter, and because of looking back, there's all kinds of evidence there of God's love for us. So I'd want to say we, we need never doubt that, but maybe there are certain things we might need to question sometimes. Maybe actually sometimes questioning and doubts is an important part of growing in our faith. Let me give you an example. There was a, I, I watched on YouTube this video of, a, of an interview with this young lady. A friend sent me this, uh, this interview and uh, uh, very interesting how she, just a super Christian lady, a missionary, went off to the mission field. I think it was China or something like that, uh, but really started to struggle. And she started to speak to her Christian friends about what she was going through and what she was feeling. And the kinds of things they were saying to her were, there must be some sin in your life, figure it out and deal with that and you'll be okay. Or the other thing was, you just need to have more faith. And so all they had for her were these kind of spiritual answers to maybe something that maybe wasn't a spiritual problem. It turns out that eventually she went beyond Christianity. She went to a, a doctor of, of some sort and started to receive help and really started to feel like she was being helped. Whereas when she was with her Christian circles, and I, I don't know which Christian tradition she was in within, not, not ours, uh, but some other one, and whatever Christian tradition she was in, there was absolutely no room for, for her questions, for her doubts about their answers to her questions. It was only after she moved to a completely different perspective did she start to get, aha, some help. Maybe sometimes we need to leave room for questions. Maybe, maybe sometimes doubt is important part of growth. Wouldn't it have been a wonderful thing if the guys who got on those planes that fateful morning on a, on a September 11th, quite some time ago now, if they had some doubts about what they were doing, if they had some doubts uh, before they flew those planes into the World Trade Center, wouldn't it have been good if they had had some doubts? Yet they were absolutely certain that what they were doing was the right thing to do. Sometimes doubt is very important. And we might say, well, that's just, that's just fundamentalist Islam. Well, sometimes we as Christians can do the same thing, whereby not allowing any room for questions, not allowing any room for any kind of doubting, that we can end up actually harming people. So we want to be careful then to leave room actually for questioning and doubts. Zechariah had his question, and yes, he, he should have known better. He should have been ready for the supernatural, uh, given his background, given his knowledge of God. And so maybe he deserved a wee bit of scolding there. But notice it didn't disqualify him from the love of God. It didn't disqualify him from him being a part of this beautiful story of God's love that we find expressed in the Christmas story. What about you? Now, what about me? Do we sometimes need to just tell ourselves, come on, take a, take a step of faith? It's a reasonable thing to do. But sometimes do we need to sell or tell ourselves, you know what? It's okay to have questions. It's okay to have doubts. In fact, maybe there's even some things that we need to start questioning or start doubting. Faith can be a messy thing, but it's a beautiful thing. 
How is your faith story turning out? Do you trust in God's love? Are you ready to watch for God's supernatural work in your life? Are you ready to look back and see how God has supernaturally shown his love for you at the incarnation, the Christmas story, at the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Easter story? Do you see how God has worked supernaturally in those events for you, expressing his love for you? And are you ready to see God's hand in your life, again, working supernaturally for you? But do you also have room for questions and doubts? Faith gets messy, but it never messes up the love of God. We invite you to participate with us as we remember Jesus, as we remember God's love demonstrated for us through Jesus, and we do so through the Lord's table. And uh, so you're invited to join us. You don't need to be a formal member of Calvary Baptist, or indeed, you don't need to be a member of any church really to join with us. Rather that, um, that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And if that's not you today, and you're, you're still considering where, where you're at in your faith, though messy though it may be, well, it's okay. We're, we're, we're certainly glad that you're with us today. Uh, but for those who would like to join with us, maybe you want to get some elements, any, any kind of bread, any kind of juice will do, any, even water is fine. And uh, please uh, feel free to pause the video and go get your stuff, and, uh, and then we'll remember the Lord in this way. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we take the bread, the symbol of Christ's body that was broken for us. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we partake of the cup, a symbol of the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this bread, for the cup, for these symbols that remind us of your great love for us. We, we lo thank you, Lord, for, for that wonderful love shown through the incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas. That wonderful love that, uh, that we see when we look at Easter, that, that great love shown through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, thank you for that wonderful love. And we thank you, Lord, that as, as messy as our faith can get, Lord, that it can never mess up your, your love for us. So, Lord, thank you for that great love. We would pray for one another. We'd pray for those that do not know you. We'd pray for you, those who really have no sense of hope this Christmas. We pray for those who have a real sense of fear these days. We pray for those, Lord, who are facing difficult circumstances, whether they're in the hospital, whether they're facing tests or test results, whether, Lord, the various things people might be struggling with in our day, um, struggling maybe with, with relationship difficulties, uh, maybe with, uh, with financial difficulties, whatever it may be, Lord, we pray for one another. We ask your blessing. But thank you, Lord, for the wonderful blessing of knowing you and having your Holy Spirit in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And amen. Hello, everybody. Proof that time travel can be done. I am speaking from five hours in your future. As a spokesperson for the Hodgson household, it is my honour and privilege 
to wish you all a happy and holy Christmas and a really blessed 2021 on behalf of my wife Marie and myself. Always keep in mind the reason for the season and if you're tempted to partake, make sure that the only spirit is his holy one. We are hoping that the new year will be really happy for us all and that the wheels will turn smoothly and quickly enough for me to pass on these wishes to each one of you personally next Christmas. So on behalf of my wife and I, have as good a time as you can, be happy, be blessed, keep safe, and we look forward to seeing you all next year. God bless. Hello, my name is John Rickey, and I'd like to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Especially for you remember, this was a, a special time when God came into the world, took on a human body to die for us. What a wonderful Savior. As we remember, we have a God that cares for us, knows how we feel, took on a human body, and truly loves us and showed it. What a wonderful gift to remember this Christmas. May you all have a wonderful, Merry Christmas. God bless you all. Hi, I'm Jackie. And I'm John. We are the Brumblecombs. We're here to wish you a very, very Merry Christmas. We hope that during this time that you will find peace and love and hope and joy and that you'll stay connected with people and very soon we're going to be together. So together we say Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Well, we thank you for joining with us in worship today and we thank those who have sent in uh, Christmas greetings and that's a reminder to us to, uh, to keep in connection with one another. And this is Advent so technically we should be singing Advent hymns but uh, we can't help but sing the carols, so that's a reminder too that you can find those in the Songs and Hymns playlist uh, that go along with today's worship expression. And a reminder today too that giving can be a part of worship. And as we're speaking about that, we want to highlight that uh, now that we're into December, we have a new Hope Fund project. And that is that we're looking to fill a stable uh, through the Canadian Baptist Ministries. And so you can learn more about that online. We have a website dedicated actually to a fundraiser for that. Uh, but you can also just give to the Hope Fund in the usual way that we give to the Hope Fund. So you can either do it through the Hope Fund or you can go to that website that we'll leave a link to. And so God bless you in that. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. You guys didn't join me in the Amen. <laughs>